about a bunch of revolutions that occur in the early 19th century. So um, uh, I'm not sure how much the sub got across to you, uh, but do we remember what impact Napoleon had? Because he basically conquered Europe or made allies of it. Do you remember what impact he had when he put all of his reforms out? Because the civil code was implemented in a lot of those other states. Well, you can't. You don't have to put your hand down. Like, what? What was the impact of the civil code being spread around? People learned about enlightenment ideas. Yeah. Okay. So they do end up learning a lot about certain enlightenment ideas. Definitely. Cool. Uh, like, what ones do you think might be particularly important? Natural rights. Yeah, natural rights are a big one. Okay. Uh, they learn about natural rights. What uh, What are their impact with those? Civil code uh, reforms have as they spread throughout. Inspired nationalistic movements. How? Like uh, in the German states, it like banded more like a unified, powerful German state to like uh, chase out the French. Okay. Well, they they didn't actually do that this time though. But it does have to do with the French and nationalism. So, does anybody else want to take a stab as to why Napoleon marching around, basically conquering Europe? or almost conquering Europe, uh, how that might stir up nationalism. Because you're right, it does stir it up, but uh, no, I'll still give you money for that, though. Um, people saw neighbors as citizens, rather than strangers or like enemies. Instead of citizens of the same society, they should help each other out. Yeah, based on what? You're right. Uh, culture, race, language. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so basically kind of what happens is we go from the feudal era where uh, I have like a circle of, of of sympathy or empathy for people, right? People that I know about and I care about, everyone else is just like a stranger, uh, or maybe even uh, back then, like not even human, uh, at least to them, right? That's why they could have slavery across the world for all of civilization uh, and uh, not think twice about what they're doing to another human because they don't really see them as another human. Um, who did I identify with prior to the 19th century in Europe? So like I had this like circle of people that I considered part of me uh, what what was that circle? Uh, I was gonna say your social class, like where you are from your class. Um, perhaps like to a point, um, but I would I would say it's even because that's that's pretty big. I, I would say it's even smaller than that. Religion could be religion. Also big though, also big. But you're not wrong in that they wouldn't see them as fellow people, but they don't they don't extend their understanding to individuals. Like if you do something wrong to somebody else who might also be a Christian, but they don't know you, like, you're not going to get any sort of sympathy or empathy from them. Um, under Obama. Okay, we're getting closer. All right, we started huge. Social class, that's a big, big net. Religion, that's probably even a bigger net. Now, monarchs are a little bit more reduced, potentially. Under lo local king. Yeah, local, uh, any local authorities. So, like, sometimes it was even just your village. Even the village down the road was different people, and you extended no concern for them whatsoever. Uh, this is where our network of, of understanding and connection is going to actually like go up one notch, essentially, in the West. So it's going to expand from like your association with those in your village uh, to, I guess, towards the later, the early modern era, it would extend to uh, larger circles, like maybe your monarch, certainly perhaps the... Uh, whatever lord was in, was in your area, whoever uh, had the manor. Uh, but here's where it extends even larger, way beyond just your village or beyond, thank you, yeah. uh, either just beyond uh, your village or even your uh, uh, feudal or fiefdom that you're on. Uh, it's gonna extend to all people that, are, that you see as like you. And the, uh, the criteria they use for that is sometimes religion, but mostly starting now, uh, common culture, language, and even potentially race, certainly ethnicity, because that's kind of a bundle of those things. Uh, so Germans start to see other Germans as uh, part of their community, at least more so than they did. Uh, French people, obviously, under Napoleon and the French Revolution, start seeing each other as a, a nation of French people, rather than a bunch of little kingdoms competing for control of the monarchy. Not that that went away, but it started uh, people thinking like that. Uh, what are some other places that are not united that uh, have people that are of common uh, ethnicity and or culture. Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary? I would say actually no on that one, but, but that's my next question though, is about them specifically. Italian cities. Yeah, Italians, exactly. So it expands from uh, just my village uh, to of course late, uh, early modern era, more so uh, perhaps my monarch or uh, uh, whoever lords looking over me. But after 
the 18th century, after Napoleon especially, it's going to expand one greater uh, um, uh, tier or level uh, to any, any common uh, culture, language, race, ethnicity. And uh, one area where people are not united, but they start increasingly feeling as if they, they should be, would be Italy, uh, because there's a whole bunch of Italian states, but there's no like Italian kingdom. So there's uh, a bunch of them. There's like Piedmont. Uh, there, uh, a big, big chunk of Italy is actually controlled by Austria. Uh, you've got the, the the Pope. You've got a kingdom called Naples. And you've got a bunch of tiny little states, essentially. So these are all people that speak Italian, partake in whatever Italian culture is, but they're not united under one government. Okay, that's one. What's another major area that's a bunch of states of similarly uh, uh, ethnic people that are not united, but some are increasingly wanting to be. Germany. Yeah, Germany is another area that's not united yet. Uh, but this Prussian area here, uh, they are uh, have a lot of commonalities uh, regarding uh, language, culture, etc. Right. So I've got you know Prussia, the largest, biggest one, but um, a bunch of other smaller states too. So areas like uh, what is now Germany, Italy, these are a bunch of disunited but uh, common culture, ethnicity. Uh, groups that are increasingly starting to see each other as a, a common crowd. They want to make a nation state. What do we, when I say nation state, what do I mean? And the crowd goes silent. We're a nation state. France is a nation state. Germany's a nation state. Uh, state based on uh, language, race, uh, religion? Yeah, it's a state based on nationality instead of a monarchy or a religion or any other random measure. All right, so nationality would mean I'm a citizen of the United States. All right, do I have to be a specific race to be a citizen of the United States? No, right, or language or anything like that. What unites me is uh, us agreeing to adhere to the rules and culture of this political entity. All right, so it's, it's really what you call abstract. Like we don't all believe the exact same thing. We don't all look the exact same way. We don't all speak the same language, but we do all consider ourselves part of one political entity, even though we disagree inside of it. Uh, that's what a nationality or nation state is. That's different than uh, a feudal state, right? Which is people are forcibly under control of uh, uh, some form of hierarchy, whether it's a monarch or a lord, or and that's pretty much how it's always been. Even if you replace the titles, it's like someone controls this area with an iron fist and you're all forced to be a part of it. Um, you're not necessarily forced to be here. You could revoke your citizenship and go become a citizen elsewhere, uh, potentially depending on the nation, uh, if they would accept you or not. Uh, some nations even accept dual citizenship, uh, but that's what a nation state is. So it's gonna start out as kind of an ethnic similarity Uniting, but uh, it's going to, of course, uh, later on extend to just to anyone who agrees to adhere to those uh, rules and culture that are sort of inside of that political. Entity. That's what a nation state is. So we have uh, a ri the rise of nation states. Essentially, is where this begins of nation states. All right. So a couple areas where this is going to really uh, try to. It's gonna take a lot of uh, effort and there's a lot of desire to unite a bunch of independent states that have been separated for hundreds if not thousands of years. All of a sudden they're gonna to work together. Uh, the two areas where we're gonna look for that is of course what is now Italy and my markers suck, you know. Italy and uh, Germany. Okay, what about an area, which was already mentioned, uh, where I have what you'd call an empire, an imperial, uh, state and imperial means again I've conquered other people of perhaps a different ethnicity religion whatever by force and they are uh, not voluntarily a part of this uh, state where would that be because these are a bunch of tiny ones that want to unite this is where people who don't want to be united are united even though they're quite different the Ottoman Empire, yeah, Ottoman Empire is uh, an example of one I wasn't going for that but absolutely Ottoman Empire all right so here's one that I don't even have up yet Okay, Ottoman Empire, absolutely. Okay, where else do I got one? Austria-Hungary. Okay, uh, Austria-Hungary, well it's actually Austria in 1830, but uh, who's in Austria that, I should actually ask that for the Ottoman Empire too. Uh, who's in Austria, and then I'll go back to you for the Ottoman Empire. 
Who's in Austria that doesn't want to be there necessarily? Slow. Well, first of all, who are the Austrians uh, ethnically? German. German, right, okay. And uh, who are they controlling that probably don't want to be under their control? Slavic. Okay, Slavic people. So that's one. Do you know another one? It's the second biggest one. It's the one that they later have to share a name with. Jews? No, you said it earlier. What did you call the state before? Hungarians. There we go, Hungarians, yes. Uh, they're actually uh, Uralic peoples that are from the steppe region originally. The Huns invading from the uh, uh, steppe region. They're uh, genetically uh, quite different, unique from most Europeans. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, that's an example of a, an area that's forcibly united that doesn't necessarily want to be. So we've got Austria here. Austria. But of course they have areas that are uh, uh, non-German that are under control imperially, right? And that's what an imperial, that's what imperialism is. You're Conquer your coercing people to be under your control, even though they don't want to be. And oftentimes they're different cultures and religions and whatnot. So I've got some Slavic people up here at the, the Czech Republic and Slo uh, Slovakia. Uh, I've got Polish people, also Slavic, Czech. I've got uh, Hungarian people. And then I've got more Slavs down here, like Slovenians and Croats. And I've got some Italians too. All right, I've got some, uh, what else have I got down here? Romanians even, depending on where I am. Serbians. We've heard of them before. So there's a whole bunch of ethnic groups in there. That's the probably the most multiculturally diverse uh, empire, and they're going to have probably the most trouble. Where else might I find, um, besides the Ottoman Empire and the Austrian Empire, where else might I find a multi-ethnic imperial state that's largely controlled by one ethnicity? Da, da, da. Oh. Germany? Nope, they're pretty multi, uh, or sorry, they're pretty monocultural. There are some differences, but they all speak German. They're generally Christian, you know, that sort of thing. Russia, Russia actually, yes. So Russia's got Russians, obviously, uh, but they're kind of constrained to this area-ish, right? And they're much larger than that. So I've got other Slavs that don't necessarily want to be part of it, like Ukrainians. Uh, I've got um, uh, Uralic people from the steppe, the Tatars. Um, they uh, also control Polish people, which don't want to be a part of them. Uh, the Baltic peoples of like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. They are not Russian. They've got some Finnish people under control. So there's a lot of non-Russians that Russia is actually controlling. Okay, and then uh, since I accidentally skipped it, Russian Empire. Uh, Who's the Ottoman Empire got under their control that are not Turkish and willing participants? Slavs and Greeks. Slavs and Greeks. Yep, yep. So that's not it, though. Hold on, let me catch up on these. So you've got that one. I feel like I'm skipping somebody else. Did you answer one? Which one did you answer? Or am I misremembering? Uh, Italy. Oh, yeah, the Italy part, that's right. Okay. Um, yes, we've got Slavs here under control of the Ottoman Empire that don't want to be. So I've got some Serbians, I've got some Macedonians, some Bulgarians. They aren't Slavic, but uh, some, Bul some Bulgar people. I've got some Greeks. Those are a bunch of Europeans under the control that don't want to be. I've also got a bunch of Greek people in Anatolia, going back to the Byzantine Empire, too. Christians? Yep, Christians. Not necessarily an ethnic group, but those are all Christians. Uh, there's another major ethnic group that's largely here that are not Turkish. Still Islamic, but uh, not willingly participants of the uh, uh, Turkish regime. Egyptians. Yeah, uh, and they are mostly what? They're actually a, me a mix. That's that's pro they're they're the Mamluks, right? They got a, the mix of all kinds of uh, uh, different groups because of the foreign uh, warriors back from the Caliphate days. If you guys remember that one, um, who's mostly here though? And there's a lot in Egypt too. Who 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 who? Arabs. Yeah, there we go. Arabs. Sweet. All right, cool. So Arabs are all throughout this Middle East, and they are not Turkish. All right, so I have a whole bunch of uh, discontent for two reasons, and this is going to be largely the moving factor for these revolutions that I haven't even started describing yet. Uh, the, major, the biggest factor, I'm going to the majorest, uh, the largest factor that's going to drive these revolutions, starting in 1830, Revolutions of 1830. Uh, the biggest driver by far is nationalism. 
And that can come in two forms, wanting to unite, like Germany and Italy, or wanting to separate, like uh, the empires of uh, the Ottoman Empire, Russia, and um, uh, Austria, in this case. Right? So whether it's to unite, similar, or separate, uh, different. Make sense? Yes. Good one person nodded. All right. Uh, all right. What's my other big motivation do you think going to be for reforms? Because you only have a revolution if you want change. So it makes sense that some people want to either unite or separate based on nationalism. Uh, what might be another reason that has nothing to do with nationalism that would cause people to want to reform? Oppression. Oppression? What do you mean? So like one uh, ruler, someone higher up, using their power to keep the lower people down. Oh, cool. So uh, what word could I use to describe people that don't want <coughs> rulers abusing their power? Okay, you did describe it perfectly, though. So yeah, they want to get people that are abusing their power. Equal. Equal? Okay, yeah. fair enough. So uh, one word we can use to describe when um, we want equal opportunity and the protection of natural rights and universal suffrage. There's a term. It's actually two words. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice. Classical, liberalism. classical liberalism. Yeah, hey, it worked. All right, uh, so we can just shorten that to uh, liberal reforms. So some of those ideas you guys already know from the Enlightenment, it's things like natural rights protection, they want suffrage, and again, we're not talking like they're suffering, we're talking voting rights, and uh, constitutions, right? So they want protection, uh, they want to take some power away from the nobles or monarchs and give it to themselves, essentially. All right, 1848, we're gonna add another category too, of very upset people that uh, want some change. In fact, some guy writes a book in 1848 that further inspires them uh, to uh, rise up and change things. I won't write it yet because we're talking about 1830, 1848. 1848, some guy, two guys, write a book and a big old chunk of people are like, yeah, and then they, uh, they decide that they also want to uh, reform things potentially violently. Marxism yeah, Marxism. So it's gonna be working class people that want reforms, but we'll, we'll save that for 1848. 1830 is the first one. Okay, so here's my first series uh, of revolutions. Um, before I mention that, though, I, I actually forgot to mention this. There's a, what term do I use to describe people who want to keep things traditional and the same? Maybe they do want to change things, but they're super skeptical or resistant to uh, ideas about change. Conservative. Yeah, conservatives, cool. Do you know any conservatives at this time? Specific ones, maybe one or two, that are like, no, 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 no. We gotta go back to the way things were, or at least mostly to how things were and change either slowly, according to the opinion of one of them, or not at all, according to the opinion of the other. You don't remember? Okay, what you got? Napoleon III. Um, no, actually, he wants things to, uh, he's a little bit of both. But I'm talking about 1830, you're right in the future. He's a new conservative who's like, I'll give you some things so you don't overthrow me, but I wanna keep things as close to the way they were as they are. Who, who, who? Licked with the what? Licked with the oh, list. Friedrich List. Uh, economically, yeah, he does go back the way things are a bit with protectionism. Uh, Bismarck? Bismarck? Nope. Good guess. He's a new conservative, just like he mentioned. Um, Burke! There we go. Cool. Uh, so, prior to these revolutions, I'll actually put it over here. Uh, from a, the period from 1815, to 1848 is like, a, um, it's a very conservative period in Europe as far as how governments act. So uh, there's two guys that spearhead this, this movement. One that does it philosophically is Edmund Burke, who I think I mentioned before, correct? Yeah. Yeah, from England. And he's a, uh, he's a conservative uh, philosophically. And again, that doesn't mean that they want no change. They want everything to be traditional just because, for tradition's sake. But he does think, hey, there are some things that work. We don't want to throw the whole thing out because then we'll lose the things that work. So we'll, we want to change them slowly, just like we did here in England, right? How they did it gradually. Uh, so he's a gradualist. So again, he believes, uh, believes the ruling classes should uh, stay and then slowly add in uh, non-traditional ruling people. So who would the 
traditional ruling classes be? You can just shout it out. Lords. Yeah, lords, like nobles, kings, monarchs, etc. Maybe maybe the church too, depending on where you're at. Uh, and then the who are the new people he's talking about that want in? Parliament. Okay, but I could have nobles in parliament. Okay, certainly working class would be at the bottom of his list, but yes, you're right. And then the in between, the middle class, right. So he's referring to gradually letting in potentially middle class people. And I don't, I don't think he meant working class people per se, but yes, eventually them uh, as well. Okay, the other guy who's not as nice and open about this, and by the way, he's the one that gets the name uh, for this era as the age of Metternich, is uh, Prince Metternich of uh, Austria. Uh, and he just believes straight up that all non-nobles and clergy or monarchs are inferior and they should remain in their place as peasants, essentially. So uh, maintain the status quo or how things already are, which is, of course, monarchs, nobles, and the church, everybody else subservient to them because they're naturally more gifted and talented and smarter and chosen by God and all that crap, all right? So those are the two guys. One of them you could definitely say is worse than the other, but... Nonetheless, both of them want things to step back, and they actually do. There's a big thing in 1815 that I didn't talk with you about, but hopefully the sub did. Um, what happened in 1815 when all the, the uh, governments of Europe got together and tried to roll the clock back uh, territor territor blah, territorially and uh, politically? Um, Congress of yeah, Congress of Vienna, which is just meeting, essentially is what that means. It's not like they have a Congress of the House and the Senate. Uh, so this was all started in 1815 uh, with the Congress of Vienna. And uh, all those governments got together and they decided, hey, um, we are going to uh, make sure that this Napoleon thing doesn't happen again. We want our monarchs and our nobles and our church to stay in power. So if we have another France situation, we're all going to uh, work together to s prevent this thing from spreading. Because when it happened last time, what happened with revolutionary France? When, uh, when they had this revolution and kicked out the king and made their own government. Oh, what? They ran, oh, yeah, they ran in terror, but like they probably didn't care as much about what happened in France as what happened out of it. But you're not wrong. That's awful. They killed the monarch and nobles. Yeah, that's kind of related to the reign of terror thing. So certainly they fear for their own lives. Absolutely. All right. The, the reign of terror showed that clearly. But like, why would they care if it happened in, uh, uh, in Austria? If I'm in Russia, who cares if Austrian Empire happens? Or if I'm in Prussia and it happens to Austria. Who cares if it happens to Austria? I'm not in Austria. Yeah, they're afraid of it spreading outside of the borders like it did in France. Right? Napoleon just kept on rolling uh, and took those reforms elsewhere. So they want to stop this from happening in any country because they realize that, and that was, by the way, the explicit goal of the French Revolution was to have it here and spread it. And Napoleon did that, right? Uh, so they want to stop it from starting. Stop it from starting, yeah. They want to prevent it from starting anywhere so it can't spread. That's the idea here. So that's the concert of Europe, uh, as sometimes it's called, or the uh, age of Metternich. It's the same thing. So concert of Europe, meaning they're working together, or the age of Metternich, because he's the one that orchestrated this agreement in Vienna. OK, so what's their goal? What do they want to do? Somebody tell me. You're getting all the money today. Stop the uh, nationalistic ideas from spreading. Yeah, okay. Uh, so then uh, give me an example of how that might happen. Say um, Spain, rises, Spain's lower class rises up. And okay. Takes over the government. And so who cares? They're in Spain. I don't care about the Spanish. And then Spain starts expanding into France or... Yeah, their ideas, right? Yeah, that's what they're trying to prevent. So if it picks up anywhere, it doesn't matter where it is, they want to snuff it out because uh, they don't want it spreading again. That's basically what they, they think of as like a parasite that they want to contain or quarantine and snuff out. They don't want it spreading throughout Europe again. Okay, so that's the, uh, the approach of the nobles and monarchs. Uh, and now we'll get to when things get sort of nasty for them. Okay, so I have this... Uh, this sentiment of nationalism and liberalism uh, brewing in most of these countries, all right? And they've already experienced it firsthand, too. They saw what a nation state can do, because Napoleon ran over everybody. They imposed French laws, so they have this, uh, you know, like, taste in their mouth of, like, ugh, I don't want to be conquered by somebody else again. 
so they want to unite, but then they also want uh, to be involved a little bit. And some of them got to taste that too when they had the, the civil code and they abolished serfdom or granted religious freedom or whatever they did or, or allowed you to move up the ranks because you're good, not just because you're a noble. Uh, a lot of them liked those things. So they want them. <coughs> um, before I keep going though, I, I gotta make one thing clear about this. One of those things up there is the enlightenment and one of those things is the opposite. It's the counter enlightenment, which is which? Nationalism is counter because it's more like romantic. Okay, how? How is it different than, because you're right, that's the Enlightenment, that's the Romantic counter-Enlightenment. How is that counter-Enlightenment? It, it focused more on, like, oneself until, instead of, like, more with everyone and more... Who's with oneself? Them. You're right. It's more, it's more focused on, uh, uh, on, on not seeing everyone uh, and seeing just certain people. It's focused on more, on ones that more like, race, culture, religion. Yeah, their nation, right. So, an actual Enlightenment believer would, uh, it's not saying they want to get rid of nation states, but they don't care about their country and them uh, as much as they care about having everybody uh, exchange ideas and, and freedoms and things like that. All right, so this is actually not enlightenment. That's enlightenment, that's not enlightenment, right? Enlightenment's cosmopolitanism. Multiple cultures and people, no one's particularly better than the other. Uh, and we're all kind of in this race to figure the world out and help us all stop from dying, essentially. Uh, nationalism, though, is we're the best, we want the stuff, not you, and, if, and we're going to do what we can to get it so you can't get it, right? That's, that's kind of the attitude. So that's, that's counter in line. All right. But nonetheless, they're both present, uh, and they're both quite powerful here. So we start in uh, July with the July Revolution in France, and you're like, why are they having a revolution? Well, there's a pretty common formula for a uh, revolution in France. It's... Add in uh, economic downturn, famine, and then have the monarch be oppressive. You have those three things, and France just has a revolution. Which, and who can blame them? Those three things suck. So that's what happens. You have a famine in 1830. The economy's not doing so well. And uh, the monarch does something that's uh, a bit upsetting for uh, other people. Famine, uh, economic downturn. And uh, the, what does he do? July yep, so Charles X is the king. And, and he um, excludes all the common classes from elections. Like yes, okay, cool. So he, uh, he, re he excludes all of the commercial, business, middle class people from, uh, from suffrage, from voting. He takes their, their suffrage rights. Sound like a great idea? Mm -hmm. No, it's a terrible idea. Um, and this isn't another French Revolution or anything like that. It isn't. Um, but why do we care about this? Revolution, because France does change, but it's not—it's nothing like the French Revolution. Why do we care about this? Who cares? They have a revolt. They kick their king out, and they make a couple reforms. Why do we care? They got rid of noble rights. They do get rid of noble rights, but um, and you're right. In that country, they go back and do some French Revolution changes. But like we've already seen that in, the, in France before, and it was this is way less radical, by the way. Why do we actually care about this revolution? It does. It inspires other revolutions. Absolutely. Um, so, this this is actually isn't even a nationalist revolution. This is a liberal revolution, right? They're trying to win more uh, domestic rights, but nonetheless, it's going to inspire revolutions elsewhere uh, who hear about it. And uh, how does the word get around? Newspaper. Was that that wasn't a thing before? Um, it was. It was like more available, or more. Like... Yeah, it is commercially more available. So. Keep in mind, railroads and other industrial factors, the world is now more interconnected, all right? And we actually have production of, uh, of, of, of magazines in mass now. We have print shops, right? I'm not saying they're like now where they can pump out like five million papers an hour or whatever, but it's way more than it used to be of people writing it or doing a printing press, getting all little letters to line up and pressing it. Like, it's, it's quicker than that. So the news gets out faster, and this is actually gonna stir up revolutions elsewhere. So what I wanna know is, oh, and I gave you money for that too, by the way. Uh, oh, and you. To where does this spread specifically? Uh, there's primarily two or three other regions, and one that's actually rather important. Uh, Belgium. Belgium, right? Do you know that one, though? Uh, Poland? Poland? Yes, they do react, too, as, as well. Why would Poland react? They don't have a country? I think, I think they're being controlled by... Who are they being controlled by? It's actually several other countries. They are 
uh, unfortunately uh, split between, uh, at the time, Prussia, Austria, and Russia. So yes, they are quite unhappy. Um, the Italians are quite unhappy as well. You actually didn't say that one, but I just did. Uh, the Italians are quite unhappy as well because they're not united, and in some cases, Austria actually is controlling them. Uh, and then the big one is Belgium. Uh, and the reason why I mention that is, it's present to Italy, Poland, Spain as well. None of these actually uh, are what you would consider successful. Uh, you, ha you have a few leaders lose their spots and whatnot, but it's pretty localized. There's no like unification of Italy or anything yet. Uh, uh, Spain doesn't chase out the monarchy, and Poland doesn't chase out the Russians and Prussians and Austrians, right? So these uh, rise, but ultimately uh, 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 non, I don't wanna say not important, but non, I will just say not as significant, or not lasting, not significant. There is one significant one that you mentioned actually, Belgium, do you know who they're uh, breaking away from? Uh, the Netherlands. The Netherlands, right. So they actually successfully, the Belgian Revolution in 1830, they actually successfully uh, break from the uh, Dutch, the Netherlands. Why would they want to do that? Who are they? What are they? I thought they were Dutch. Oh, uh, they were French-speaking Catholics? Yeah, exactly. So they're, uh, they're, they're French-cultured. They're not French necessarily, but they do speak French, uh, or at least it's a big part of their language. And uh, they're Catholic, right? They're not actually um, Calvinist, like most of the Dutch are. So this is a good reason for them to culturally split. So would that be uh, liberal or national? Stay with you. National. Nationalistic, right. Splitting based on common culture and forming their own state. Nice. And that one does stick. We, we still have Belgium today uh, as well. So yay Belgium, and not yay what they do in the Congo. All right, so Belgium, Kingdom of Belgium established. Yay them. Somebody else is able to finally break free from imperial control <coughs> besides Belgium. Who else does? Because remember, the, the revolution only sticks really in three places, France, Belgium, the other places it doesn't really significantly cause any lasting change. One of the places does too. It's kind of far away from this area, but it's technically, it's still in Europe. Greece. Yeah, Greece. They have their war from independence. Who helps them out? They don't quite do it by themselves. France does, yes. Why would France help them? Britain helps them too, by the way. Why? It is a good question, isn't it? To stop the Ottoman Empire from spreading. Okay, but they're not spreading. The Ottoman Empire already has it. The French don't get it, the Greeks get it. Why, why, why? Is it nationalistic? Is it liberal? So they can spread their enlightenment ideals? No, good guess though. It is actually related to enlightenment. Okay, uh, do you guys know, you might actually not know this. Uh, we actually do, I don't know if this were articulated. Uh, where do people like kind of point to the start of Western civilization? So like Western ideas of, of skepticism and democracy and things like that. Where do, we, where, where do most people point to as like the start of that? Greece. Yeah, ancient Greece. All right, so the British and the French, and even, I think even to an extent the Russians, uh, they wanted to help the Greeks for nationalistic purposes because they saw, the, saw Greece as like the cradle of their culture and civilization. So even though they don't actually gain much from helping the Greeks. They want the Greeks to be free because they want, it's like a sense of nationalism for them. Like they're protecting their culture or something like that, right? It's almost like a crusade type thing. Like, oh, we want our Christian stuff back. So they go and, you know, temporarily take back some of those, that territory. Uh, this isn't religious though. This is like a cultural thing. So I have the Greek War of Independence, which has been going on for a while. They've been going on since I think 1821. But in 1828, 29, uh, the uh, French specifically send a force over there uh, to help the Greeks. The Greeks were already winning against the uh, Turks, but then a vassal state came to the aid uh, uh, of the Turks and uh, turned the tide, but then the French came, it was it was GG, because they're industrialized and the Ottoman Empire is not. Egypt. Yeah, Egypt is going to. And when the French arrive in 1828, uh, obviously they have an industrialized uh, military uh, and, and navy, so, it's not much of a match at that point. But uh, yeah, we do have uh, the uh, Greeks uh, win independence from uh, the Ottoman Empire. And kind of the reason for that was uh, 
the British and French, and they, again, I think even the Russians too, they wanted to help out the Greeks because they saw that as like the foundation of Western culture. So they wanted the, that cradle of their culture to be at least free. Uh, they saw it as like a duty of theirs, I guess. Um, I think it's good to help anybody escape from imperialism, but that was their reason. So uh, when independence from the empire, and they were aided by, uh, by the French uh, versus the Turks uh, and the Egyptians. All right, well done. Okay, uh, other than that though, not much changes. It's significant, you have domestic changes in France, you have Belgium becomes a country, Greece uh, liberates itself, and then later on, shortly after, Bulgaria and um, uh, Serbia do too, and that's nice. Uh, but it's not like the entire continent got swept uh, into a revolution. Um, but later on, it is going to uh, uh, look more like that circumstance. So what, what does this reflect, by the way? If I'm an observer at the time in 1830, what do I, what do I now know about um, the situation in Europe? Because it's been the same way for so long. Like, what is this a good indication of? The increase of nationalism. Okay, yeah, well, certainly that times are changing. Okay, how is this different from other times? Because we've had people try to, you know, conquer territory before, and we've had people try to escape from imperialism before. What's different about this one? This is like actually now establishing states. Okay. Well, France has been there for a long time. England's been there for a long time. Greece was there for a long time. Why, uh, well, I guess technically wasn't. It was technically the Roman Empire and all of that, but it was Greece before. But um, what this is kind of showing is, well, what were my motivations for conquest before, maybe? Maybe we could focus on that. Why would people go to war before? There was a couple reasons, but they were always the same couple reasons. Um, gain territory. Yep, greed, right? They want to gain territory. They want to control some other ethnicity or whatever. And what's the other one? Uh, yeah, it, it, it might be religiously motivated, right? They think they have to defend or spread their religion, whatever it might be. Uh, so those are the two primary reasons. How is this one different, though? Or did your hand go down? It actually went down, huh? How is this different? Especially the Greek example. What did the British and French benefit from this? Yeah, they gained access to some ports and all that, but that's not that much. And, and what's up with the Belgium thing? And, uh, and, and all these other places? What are they trying to do? What's different about this? They're forming national identities. Yeah, they are. It, it's either about forming or protecting national identity, not a religion or anything like that. Uh, and, but also, they're doing the motivation for helping Greece. There was like almost no gain there. Uh, there, there was some, like I said, access to some ports and all that. But like, uh, they're not gaining territory. They're not gaining a large amount of wealth. Uh, they're largely doing it to uh, uh, protect their, their culture, not Christianity uh, uh, specifically, but uh, there's this nationalistic fervor. And is it, is it just in France now? No, it's well beyond that. It, it's, it's reached most of, uh, of Europe at this point. So this is a good indication of what's going to come, because what is going to come in the 1840s and 50s and 60s and 70s is this whole map is going to change. And then by World War I, this map is going to be totally different. Uh, and I'm going to have a lot of what we know later as self-determined nations, right, that are uh, generally ethnically kind of homogenous, not exactly though, uh, and uh, pick their own governments, right? Uh, before human history, prior to World War I, you didn't get to pick your own government for the most part. Uh, you didn't get to participate in your government for the most part. And uh, it certainly wasn't based on your culture or nation. It was based on either just straight greed uh, or on, on religion. So that's that's where this change is, is coming in. It's not enlightenment, but uh, it's probably better than feudalism and all that. Uh, let's take a break and I'll do 1848 after.